Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, husband. Good morning. I was praying that the technology would not fail us, but even when technology fails, God never fails. I'd like to um, welcome you and I'd like to welcome Stephen and Shelby. It's good to see you here this morning. Um, I have some friends on, uh, online, Misty and Preston. I want to just say I'm proud of you and for, of what God's done in your life. You may wonder about the title of today's sermon, Demigods. What is a demigod? According to Wikipedia, a demigod, meaning half god, is originally a Greek mythological figure whose one parent was a god and whose other parent was human. As such, demigods are human god hybrids. If you're a gamer, you might be familiar with a game of the same name. I'm not a gamer, but I got this explanation of the game from the Demigod Game website. It says, A god has fallen. The All-Father has vanished, creating an opening in the pantheon. To fill the void, demigods from across the mortal world must wage war against one another in a bid to ascend to true godhood. This is the stuff your kids are playing when you're not looking, parents. But I'd like to propose that since the origin of sin, the true Heavenly Father has had competition for the place of supremacy in the hearts of some of his created beings. The day that Eve fell into temptation in the garden, she was informed by God's greatest enemy that if she ate the fruit, she would become like God. You can read it with me. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. That's the day that humanity entered the great controversy between God and Satan. And that's the day that we became pawns of the enemy of God in that very war. And that's the day that humans began to immediately suffer the consequences of being separated from an all-knowing, all-loving Heavenly Father who wanted to protect His children from the lies of the biggest liar who ever lived. So are we trying to be demigods? Unfortunately for Eve and the rest of us, she actually believed the lie. And rather than gaining unique capabilities and awe-inspiring powers that would allow her to ascend to God's throne, she rode an emotional high and enticed her good and godly husband to join her in a deadly decision, to test God and see if he truly would follow through with the parental warning of, the day you eat thereof, ye shall surely die. And at that moment of sin, both Adam and Eve became desperately in need of a savior. It took them a minute to figure it out at first. They didn't, want, <clears throat> they didn't want to face the consequences of their poor decision. Are we like that sometimes? They just hid, hoping that no one would notice. They kind of buddied up together in the woods. Next, when they were confronted, they blamed someone other than themselves. Pointing fingers, they refused to take responsibility for their own actions. Early in the game, denial entered human hearts. Since they were dealing with God and not an earthly parent or spouse or friend, they could not hide their sin for very long. They had to come clean, and they had to admit their guilt. They did, and they took responsibility. They repented, but then they had to accept the life-altering consequences of being escorted from their beautiful garden home. They knew they would never be able to again enter its guarded gates, this side of eternity. But that's Adam and Eve's story. The title of their book could have been, The Day We Tried to Be the God of Our Own Lives. Each of us has a similar story. We could all write the chapters of days we've taken control and tried to be the God of our own life. Some of us tell our stories. Some tell only parts of stories, and some of us live out our stories in silence. 
The silent one was me for many years. I couldn't verbalize my reality, not even to those closest to me. For the longest time, not even to myself, I couldn't believe my own story. Today I want to begin our time together by sharing just a piece of my story. Some of you have heard parts of it before, so I ask you to bear with me as I reformat it here. And you might ask why, because I believe that story is over is powerful for overcoming the destroyer of souls. Our stories are are powerful for encouraging one another in our walk with Jesus. Read with me from Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. And they overcame him, the devil, by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. Let's pray before I begin my story. Dear Father, this story is not about me. It's actually about you. So I just humbly ask you to fill me as I share today. I ask for your spirit to come and move among the hearts of each person in this room. May we be inspired and refocused to connect um, tightly with you, Lord, to allow you to walk to walk out our lives in us. Thank you, in Jesus' name, amen. My story goes a little bit like this. When I was in college, I fell in love with the son of an Adventist pastor. We dated exclusively for about three years. I wanted to marry him. He had other dreams. He never breathed a word that sounded anything remotely like a proposal. So I felt frustrated as one by one my girlfriends began to marry and begin their families, and I ended our relationship. I promptly married the next person who actively pursued my heart and my hand. Unfortunately, I didn't do my research, and Mr. Next Person brought a bunch of skeletons into our shared closet. It wasn't long into our marriage that those skeletons began rattling around in there, and really messing up my idealistic dreams of a happy Christian family. Young people, if I can just interject something right here, I'd like to encourage you, do your homework. Do it. (laughs) When it comes to dating someone, a casual relationship with someone you would not ideally spend the rest of your life with, that could turn out to be the very... Um, beginning of a long, painful journey that could be avoided by sticking to your standards, following God's principles in the first place. So do your homework. I'd been raised in a fairly conservative Seventh-day Adventist home, vegan diet, didn't own a TV, spirit of prophecy for sundown worship. If you were raised like that, you might know what I'm talking about. If you weren't, forget it. (laughs) It's a different language. But I wasn't exposed to many of the influences of the world until I was in high school. I didn't attend my first movie in a theater until I was a junior in college. I knew little to nothing about drugs except that they were bad. My new husband, on the other hand, was raised in a very different type of Christian home. Unbeknownst to me, he had begun smoking at the age of six. He had a good working knowledge of alcoholic beverages, and he had used hard drugs in high school, if not before. When I met him, he seemed like a nice, quiet guy who was eager to please. In fact, he was so set on pleasing me that he joined the Seventh-day Adventist Church on profession of faith. He'd already been baptized in another denomination. He sat in the pew next to me most Sabbaths over the next 14 years, even taking position as a deacon in one of our rural congregations. I'm not sure exactly when he began using cocaine again. It took me a long time to figure out that he had a drug problem. And by the time I put a name on what was making my husband act like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, we were in a financial, spiritual, and marital mess. The closet skeletons had taken over our lives. Maybe some of you have had a similar experience. But in my hurry to 100% blame my husband for every single problem we experienced, I began to play down my own issues. Since he was the one with the real addiction, I denied that my coping mechanisms were anything that needed to be addressed. 
It took me a long time to own the fact that I numbed my pain with control, with ice cream, with work, with creating the facade of a happy life because I was too proud to admit how bad things really were or to seek help for myself. I wanted God and rehab and 12-step programs to fix my husband. I didn't think that I needed any fixing. So it was in the middle of that mess that I really found God. He'd been part of my life for my whole life. But I'd not known him fully and intimately until he became my husband and provider and sustainer and father and friend. I had not known the power of praying God's word until that word became my best weapon against the enemy who was destroying my husband and coming after me with a vengeance. So my little world that had been held up with toothpicks and facades came crashing down the very first time I had to drive him to a live-in treatment facility for alcoholics and addicts. When I returned home to an empty house, overwhelming credit card debt, and just a week until the beginning of another school year, where I taught first and second grade at our little church school, I was overwhelmed with frustration, with fear, with embarrassment, with shame, anger, bitterness. My mother was living in faraway Switzerland at that time, and the only arms I had to fall into were my heavenly father's. But guess what? He was enough. His chest was hard enough to beat on with balled up fists. His heart was soft enough to love me through the hurt, and his arms were never too short to save. His big godly ears never tired of hearing my cries. The Bible says in Isaiah 59, verse 1, you can read it with me. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. And through those years that followed, I lost much. I lost a business that um, my sister and I had started from scratch along with my husband. I lost a home that I designed and put a tremendous amount of work into myself. Uh, I shared this with the women one, one prayer breakfast. I lost a child who was adopted into another family after the placement agency discovered my husband's drug use. I lost my support system of trusted friends when in vain we moved to another part of our state in hoping to give him a fresh start. I lost my car that I had paid for. Little roots of bitterness can crop up lots, lots of times. <laughs> when my husband gave it to his girlfriend. And ultimately, I lost my marriage when he chose a different type of life with another type of wife. So those were the big, big losses, and many small ones in between. But through the valley of the shadow of loss, I learned to communicate with my God in personal ways, in relevant ways that enabled me to feel loved, to feel like I was seen and heard by him. I grew deep, deep roots with Jesus that have held me through many storms and even enabled me to find joy in the midst of crazy, that is addiction. <laughs> and when you live with someone who's an addict, it can really be crazy. But God gave me some, some real joy through that, that time. I learned to trust that he had something better for my future than I ever could have imagined myself. And I can promise you I never imagined to be married to a pastor and standing up preaching a sermon in a church. So <laughs> not long after I took my husband to rehab for the first time, the mother of one of my students brought me a gift, and it was a book called Praying God's Word by Beth Moore. Of any gift I've ever received, it was the gift that keeps on giving. The subtitle is Breaking Free from Spiritual Strongholds. See, I was under the impression that it was my husband who had all the problems, and I was simply the victim. But as I began to work my way through chapters on overcoming pride overcoming the insecurity of feeling unloved, overcoming rejection, overcoming unforgiveness, depression. I realized that I had a lot of issues of my own, and I needed a savior. I needed some practical tools in my tool belt, just as much as my drug addict husband did. And that, my friends, is the beginning of all recovery.
First, admitting and accepting that we have a problem. In church talk, it's called surrender. Here's how it looks as outlined in the first three steps of the AA program. Number one, if you've attended AA, you can say it with me, probably from memory. (laughs) We admitted we were powerless over alcohol or whatever, that our lives had become unmanageable. Number two, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Number three, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. As a result of being married to an addict, I've had the opportunity to attend a number of 12-step programs such as Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, Celebrate Recovery, maybe some others. Maybe you're familiar with some of these. There are, as you can see, many. You may be surprised to discover, as I was, that your addiction is listed. Maybe you didn't even know you had one, or that there was a group for you. But these are just a few. There's a group for you somewhere. You see, we all turn to something because we are broken, sinful people. And we all need help. Some of us just don't realize it yet. And that's where I was for most of my Christian life, until my life began to unravel. And that's when I learned to look in the mirror and begin to be real about myself. Because after he disappeared from my life, I would still be stuck with me. I had no one else to blame for my choices, my responses to stress, or my patterns of behavior. And I had to do something with all of that anger that had built up inside of me over the years of disappointment and loss. So rather than trying to continue to fix him an unhealthy codependence addiction that I had developed as a coping mechanism. I began to seek help for me, and I discovered that the principles of the 12-step programs are biblical, and they're effective for any sin pattern in any person. Hurt people hurt people. I learned that in order to effectively find wholeness, we must accept the fact that those who wound us are themselves wounded. They are incapable of breaking their cycle of sin unless they take the first steps to surrender. Once we accept that hurt people hurt people and that we may very well be the person in someone's life who has been the wounder rather than the woundee, we can then move forward to the next steps in recovery. But some spirit-inspired introspection is a necessary first step for all of us. Because according to the Bible, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So when I first began this process of introspection, I realized I had actually been interfering with what God was trying to do in my husband's life. I was acting as a demigod with my codependent behavior. And I had actually prolonged the agony for all of us by continually rescuing him from himself. I was hurt and prideful. And I was hurting both him and myself with my addiction to rescuing. In recovery groups, it's called codependency. So the question is, is codependency a sin? And I'm sorry, some of that's a little blurry. But basically, um, we get mad at someone in our life, we punish them, and we try to control them because we don't like what they're doing. Then we, when they really get into trouble and mess up badly, we rescue them and we try to fix them, bail them out, and take care of them ourselves. And then we feel bad because we become victims of their broken promises, of their social, emotional, financial problems, etc. And it's just like this sick thing that goes in circles. Dr. Henry Cloud puts it like this. We were designed by God to be responsible for our own lives, choices, gifts, and talents. A codependent person gets in the way of this normal process. When you take on responsibility for another person's life, And don't say no when you should. You're actually interfering with God's created order. If you're rescuing someone from the consequences of their own choices, you are contributing to their irresponsibility. You are part of the problem, and you need as much help as the person who isn't living responsibly. This behavior causes pain and can ruin lives. Now that's hard to hear for someone who thinks they're doing everything right and fixing everything. 
But it wasn't really long after I was out of that marriage that his choices sent him to prison with a 12-year sentence. And in prison, he was able to become clean. Well, you know, maybe God would have done that early on if I had gotten out of the way. I don't know. Hindsight, you know, is twenty twenty sometimes. But here's a healthy response um, for what I just said, for codependence. And this is from psychologist um, Dr. Larry Crabb. He says, we've all been sinned against. We all sin. You have failed to love me as you should, and I fail to love you. Your failure to love me is painful, sometimes very profoundly disappointing. But the Lord's love for me is perfect. And although his love does not remove the sting of your failure, it gives me all I need to stand as a whole person, capable of loving you regardless of the threat of your further failure. What heals broken people is God's love through his people, and his spirit, learning to trust, to extend our heart, and to take ownership over our resistance to love is all part of God's recovery program. The goal of spiritual and emotional growth isn't about becoming perfect. The goal is a deepening awareness of ourselves, of our own weaknesses, our sins, and our needs. It's an increasingly clear understanding of how much we need so great a salvation. And that phrase comes from Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3. The problem is that most of us, especially those of us like me who grew up in church or have been coming and going Sabbath after Sabbath saying, hello, how are you? I'm fine. Have a great week. See you next Sabbath. We may not actually be fine, but we're so used to painting a picture of fine to everyone around us that we may even start to believe it ourselves. We've become little demigods in putes, desperately trying to control our own lives. And we may need to ask God to reveal something to us so that we can become human again to ourselves and to one another. Denial. A false system of beliefs that keeps us from facing reality. I like this scripture in the Living Bible. It says you can't heal a wound by saying it's not there. Denial says let's not look inside. God says let's open it up and see what's festering there underneath that scabby facade. I'd like to uh, credit the Celebrate Recovery Program for the information on the next several slides that expand on the acronym for denial. The D. Denial disables our feelings. By repressing our feelings, we freeze our emotions. Understanding and feeling our feelings is freedom. I'd like for you to read the scriptures with me on these. 2 Peter 2.19 They promise them freedom while they themselves are slaves of destructive habits. For a man is a slave of anything that has conquered him. We don't want to be Christians who promise others freedoms while we are still enslaved. We want to be free so that we can share with others what Christ has done for us. That would be a healthy church. The E in denial stands for energy lost. A side effect of our denial is anxiety. Anxiety causes us to waste precious energy, running from our past, worrying and dreading the future. It is only in the present, right here today, where positive change can occur. Read with me Psalm 146. He frees the prisoners. He lifts the burdens from those bent down beneath their loads. The N negates our growth. We are as sick as our secrets. We cannot grow in recovery until we are ready to step out of our denial into the truth. God's word says, They cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he rescued them. He led them from their darkness and shadow of death and snapped their chains. Wow. Praise you, Lord. I don't know if you can see that one. It's so bright. The I stands for it isolates us from God. God's light shines on the truth. Our denial keeps us in the dark. If you can read 
1 John 1, chapter 5 through 7. Read it with me. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Wow. The A, it alienates us from our relationships. We have got to deal with the toxic cesspool that's inside of us. Denial keeps us from getting close to people. We're afraid of what they might see in our cesspool. Or if what's in there is so scary, they might just stay away of their own accord. Denial tells us we're getting away with it. We think no one knows, but they do. So what's the answer from Ephesians 4? Stop lying to each other. Tell the truth, for we are parts of each other. And when we lie to each other, we are hurting ourselves. When I stub my toe, I try to tell myself that it doesn't hurt, but it really does. We are a body, and when one of us is hurting, the whole body hurts, whether we deny that we're hurting or not. Um, the L stands for lengthens the pain. We have the false belief that denial protects us from our pain, when in reality, denial allows our pain to fester and grow and turn into something really ugly called shame and guilt. What does God promise in Jeremiah thirty seventeen? I will give you back health again and heal your wounds. It's beautiful. I want to invite you today to accept the first principle of recovery. Step out of your denial. Step in to your higher powers, Jesus Christ's unconditional love and grace. Like Tommy said in his sermon a couple of weeks ago, he said, I need to know that I've got a problem so that I can go to the problem solver. I wrote that down in my notebook while you were preaching, and I liked how it just fit right here. So if you're struggling right now with something, you're in a beautiful place because you're in a starting place. (sighs) You have to deal with the past in order to take hold of your future. John Eldridge, in the book Love and War that we went through in January uh, with the married couples, he, he said this, you will have to fight for healing and breakthrough. This does not just show up with the male. And I'd like to suggest that this fight is called recovery. So bring your history to God, whether it happened two days ago or 20 years ago. Bring it to him and allow his light and his grace to transform it. Bring his truth to bear on it and experience a reconciliation of your whole life. Recovery actually means taking back what we lost in the fall. It describes the sanctification process, the spiritual growth process, and the task of reclaiming the image of God in ourselves, of allowing him to, To make us like him. Sanctification is not about becoming demigods. It's about giving up trying to be the God of our own lives and allowing God to be God in our lives. It's beholding him and allowing him to change us from the inside out. So we're all in need of recovery. And people who are engaged, actively engaged in the recovery process, learn to love the journey for what it is, because we can't believe that one day, if I go through 365 days of recovery on day 366, I've arrived. That's not what it's about. If we think that we're going to be finished, our tendency is to become prideful and self-sufficient. Oh, I've been there. I've done that. I've worked the program. I'm finished now. I believe that any teaching that teaches us To think we've arrived at a final, satisfactory level of spirituality actually leads us out of God's arena and into the enemy's territory. As we come out of denial and begin to see our sin for what it is, I believe our being honest with God brings about confession and brings forgiveness. 
If we have not confessed the sins of the past or forgiven others for sinning against us, then these sins rule and the devil will gain a stronghold in our lives. The hurt and abuse that people often face as children show themselves in behavioral patterns, in relational patterns. These patterns result from unforgiveness in their hearts. Because they've never forgiven those who hurt them, they may still be unconsciously angry at them, and that anger comes out in strange and unusual ways, even in the church. God's word is very clear. We can read Psalm 66, 18. If I had not confessed the sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. I'd like for us to read this together, Matthew six fourteen and 15. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. You see, forgiveness is a decision. A person chooses with his or her own free will to extend forgiveness to another person. God gives us the power to follow through with that choice. Sometimes we just need a loving, supportive environment that keeps us accountable and provides the biblical tools we need to work through the steps of forgiveness. A few years ago, I really did need to get out of denial and forgive some people in my life, namely my husband. I learned in my recovery group that I had to make a decision every morning that I would walk in forgiveness that day. You've got to walk out your recovery. You choose every day. After that, that choice, I had to give the Holy Spirit permission to fill me, to give me a spirit of forgiveness towards him. And it wasn't easy. Many times I failed because he failed. I could have easily justified holding on to bitterness, anger, resentment, unforgiveness. But I didn't want my heart to become a home for those strongholds. So I continued to choose forgiveness. It's still a journey I'm consciously choosing because people hurt me, knowingly or unknowingly. And Satan's first temptation to me is is to offer me a hardened heart on a silver platter. It looks so inviting. It feels so justified. But it's something I must say no to on a regular basis. Why? Because I'm the one sinning when I choose not to forgive, no matter what they've done to me. Did you know that sin affects God's hearing? This is, this is God's word, Isaiah 59. Okay, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy that it cannot hear. Read verse 2 with me. But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you. That's pretty powerful. Sin separates us from God. And it's when we confess and break down that barrier that God really can move in our lives. 1 John 1, verse 9. We can read it together. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You don't have to have an emotional experience to be forgiven. Forgiveness is ours for the asking. We accept God's forgiveness of us by faith, claiming his promise. Psalm 103, 12, read it with me. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Praise you, God. I'm not asking us to operate from a place of guilt because godly sorrow and guilt are not the same things. Guilt-motivated people are afraid to love. They do loving things in order to feel guilty, not just because they want to do loving things. We're not in a healthy place when guilt's ought to replaces love's want to. We are not seeking reconciliation with God and others because we feel guilty. We are seeking restoration because we love our kind Father. And his love compels us to restore our relationship with others as much as possible. Even when our parents, our kids, or our significant other digs up bones that have long been buried, we must believe that God does not. 
He will never bring up a sin that has been confessed and forgotten just to make us feel bad. It's the accuser of the brethren who does that. The Holy Spirit may reveal something in our character or our life story that needs to be brought into light so God can forgive and lead us through a process of healing. But the Spirit never, ever, ever works in a way that is condemnatory or guilt-laden. God is invitational and relational. And the enemy is the one that works through manipulation, guilt, control. We fight that enemy with the Word of God. Read it with me, Romans 8, verse 5. And 1, sorry, 1 and 5. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. When I first discovered my former husband's double life and all that it entailed, I was really furious. When he finally realized that he needed help and decided to go to drug rehab, I, did, I knew I had to choose to forgive him if there was any hope for a reconciliation within the relationship, but also for my own healing and for the ability to live my life according to the Spirit. Now, forgiving like that was not a simple thing for me because I come from a long, long line of grudge holders. I've told you guys this before. It's a generational stronghold in our family, and I battled bitterness toward him on a daily basis. I actually once paid a psychotherapist $80 for him to tell me I was angry. (laughs) And I was so angry that he told me I was angry (laughs) after evaluating me for an hour. I was like, That's one thing I do already know for certain. But who wouldn't be? But I also knew that I wanted to be spirit-filled, and I wanted to be Christ-like. And I longed for my prayers to be heard as I begged God to save my husband's life. So I set out on a journey towards healing and toward having a clean line of communication between me and my Heavenly Father. And that journey included working the 12 steps in a recovery program, taking responsibility for my part in my own recovery. And it's a journey I'm still on. But God promises to finish the work that he began in me. And he promises to do the same for you. We must just allow him to do it and to cooperate with him. We cannot afford to try to be demigods in our own lives. Um, I just want to share with you for the last part of my sermon today some things I learned in my recovery and the journey that I was on and am still on. And I want to reiterate that addiction is something we all suffer from, whether we realize it or not. Sin is addiction, and we're all sinning in one arena or another. So um, I'm going to skip the first two definitions. I want to go to the counseling definition of addiction. It's compulsive behavior developed to serve as a distraction from deep inner pain resulting from emotional wounds inflicted during the formative years. It's something that we do to distract us from dealing with our stuff. And... You can see some substances and some attitudes and behaviors that commonly become addictions. Some of, some of these you might recognize. <laughs> I remember sitting in church week after week, year after year, feeling so alone in the knowledge that the person sitting next to me was a drug addict and our lives were falling apart. Church was not a place where we could air our dirty laundry. It wasn't a place where we felt we could tell anyone what was really going on in our lives. We came and said, Happy Sabbath, how are you? I'm fine, see you next week. And sandwiched between those Sabbaths was a lot of heartache and the painful reality that our church wasn't relevant to the hell we were living. Yet we kept going. And I just wonder if there's anyone sitting in our pews today who sees themselves in the mirror up here on the screen and feels the way I felt for so long. If there is, I really want to apologize to you on behalf of this church. Because we, as the body of Christ, have failed you somehow. If week after week you're looking into eyes that are not loving you, that are not accepting you, not encouraging you to move forward, 
not providing a safe place for you to share your hurts and receive practical tools to overcoming, then this body has failed you. And I'm so, so sorry. I know how lonely a place that can be. But if it makes you feel any better, you're not really alone because we're all sinners sitting right here next to you. And we all have hurts and habits and hang-ups that can easily turn into addictions. We're all Humpty Dumpty. Some of us are just better at hiding our cracks than others. Sin is the broken, wounded condition we find ourselves in as a result of mankind's separation from God, and it characterizes itself in three ways. Generational issues, someone else's hurtful actions or behavior towards us, that's abuse, and our own actions, behaviors, and choices. Sometimes in church, the way we play demigods is to categorize sin, to sanctify some sins, condemn others, to look around and justify or make light of our sin because someone else's seems just a little bit or a lot worse. Or the other way around, to stuff our sin, to hide our addiction because everyone else appears to have their act together and we're ashamed to be real enough to take off our mask. Either way, we're playing God of our own lives, denying God the power to make us victorious over every sin, stain, evil device through the blood of Jesus Christ, our Savior. God longs to deliver us from the bondage of sin. How does God want us to serve him? Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. Read this with me. That he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. Keep reading. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. God is holy and righteous. His holiness sets the standard. Righteousness is the result of a relationship that fulfills that standard. So these two words, holiness and righteousness mark two aspects of one condition. Holiness has to do with character, and righteousness is conduct, right doing. So how do we as a body serve God without fear in holiness and righteousness and encourage other people to do the same? I'd like to suggest that a Christ-centered, Bible-based, Bible-based recovery program outlines the steps one by one. It provides an atmosphere of transparency and authenticity where shame and secrecy cannot breed, but where deep healing and spiritual growth takes place. When I suggest the need for ongoing support for addiction recovery with Seventh-day Adventist Christians, I've sometimes received blank looks and a general ignorance regarding the need within our own church for such a program. For some reason, we act as if we are immune to addiction just because we may not have a traditional addict living under our nose, although many of us do. I'm hoping that the following information will hold up a mirror to our denomination so that we can stretch the borders of our limited definition of addiction. We can begin to address the issues that are preventing us from wholeness, from holiness and relevance to those outside our church who are drowning in a sea of addiction. We need to become familiar with the tools to freedom ourselves so that we can hand them with confidence to others who are desperately in need of them. Our lives need to reflect the character of Jesus Christ so that others will be drawn to the freedom that only he can provide. Unless we are aware of the unchristlike ruts in our own lives, we cannot get out of them onto higher ground and see the needs of others. So I'm standing up here today to share my story with you because I have a dream for my church, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, with our strong stance on biblical truth, our constant focus on the soon return of Jesus Christ. I love my church, but I'll tell you that in my personal journey, I've had to go outside our denomination at times in order to find a safe place to share and the support and tools I needed in order to deal with my reality. 
I've come to love and respect Christians of other faiths who are meeting the needs of their own churches and in the community around them by hosting recovery groups. This past January, when I attended the Southern Union Ministerial Conference with Andre, I was pleased to discover at a display table that our denomination is beginning to address some of the addiction issues I've mentioned today and have put together a 12-step program for Seventh-day Adventist churches to use to introduce the idea to their membership. It's called the Journey to Wholeness. It's a 52-week study that introduces participants to the principles of working a recovery program within a group. I'm wondering, I wondered, why do we need to reinvent the wheel that's already been working so well for other people? But I realized that I've sat in some scary rooms, some scary smoke-filled rooms with some really scary-looking people for recovery, some, for recovery group sometimes. And I'm, I'm thinking that maybe they, they did this so that within our own uh, little sphere, we could learn to kind of walk through it. And then um, maybe that can be a bridge to some of these other groups and other people. Because the the program actually encourages us to participate in another 12-step group. So um, I'm learning. I'm learning about it. But this program encourages members with specific issues to get help from other programs if they're going through chemical, sexual, or other issues that may require discussion leaders that have experienced victory over these areas of their lives. Well, I asked our local church board if I could order the leader's binder and go through it to explore the interest of, of you, my church members, to see if anyone's interested in participating in a Christ-centered recovery Sabbath school class for the purpose of our own growth, for the purpose of training members to become safe people who can lead more in-depth recovery groups in the future. Please understand that no recovery group asks members to share all of their issues with the entire group. Safe accountability partners are trained individuals who've experienced a level of recovery and they walk alongside someone in their journey. And Pastor Andre will be speaking more about that type of accountability in a future sermon. I'd like for you to think about that. Next week, I'm going to have um, just a little response card for you to fill out. If you're interested in participating in a class um, of that kind, if you're interested, if you've been involved in a 12-step program, if you'd be interested in in becoming a leader for a group. So please, um, this week, pray and ask the Lord what he would have you to do to be part of something like this. We need to learn to be a safe and confidential person for someone to share their deepest struggles with. Sharing is where we find accountability, and it's where we find growth. So I challenge you to allow God to heal you from the inside out so that you can become a safe person for God to use to support others on their road to recovery. We need this. I'm looking at the time, and I'm looking at you. I have, I have a couple of testimonies that um, I went to a Celebrate Recovery Church last weekend with my parents, and... Um, I'd like to maybe share with you, I'll see how it goes here at the end, what comes up next here. Yep, that's her testimony. (laughs) I'd like to share with you maybe Kathy's testimony because I can tell you about the joy that God gives to people who have experienced victory in a program like this, but it'd be much better if you could actually see the joy. I think maybe it's three minutes. If you could do Kathy's, I would appreciate it. Um, I met this woman last uh, last weekend, and she just exudes what God's done for her.
I was created for him. That's one. They had um, an entire service dedicated to the celebration of what God had done in the lives of their congregation over the past year in their Celebrate Recovery program. The next um, video testimony is from a young couple, and um, they're very lively and on fire for the Lord. They're both group leaders for some of the addiction groups, Jamie and Tara. Amen.
sweet young couple, and it was, it was really powerful to go and, and just see what's going on in another church and how they're meeting the needs of, of their community. Um, you can go ahead and turn off the, the slides. I, I'm really just about finished here. The Bible is our recovery manual. God says in Isaiah 57, I have seen his ways and I will heal him. I will lead him also and restore comforts unto him and to his mourners. It's a promise from God that he will heal us and restore comfort to us and and to those who have been um, a witness to our lives. If you're wearing a mask of denial today, I'd like to suggest that as soon as you remove that mask, your recovery, recovery will begin. Because the only unpardonable sin is the sin that I don't bring to Jesus. So maybe our hurts, habits, and hang-ups have been our identity. God wants to give us a new identity. These young people that you just saw, they have a new identity in Jesus Christ. God doesn't want us to stay frozen in our unhealthy identity. So um, in your bulletin, there's a, a blank index card. And I just want to invite you to take a first step today toward wholeness. Rather than trying to control everything and control our self-image by refusing to allow anyone to see what's going on with us. Um, rather than just saying I'm fine when all is really not fine. Um, I'd like for you to write something It can be only for God to see right now. But if you are struggling with a hurt, habit, or hang-up that you know you need to get over, and the Holy Spirit is telling you, we're all in need. (laughs) There's a level ground at the foot of the cross, whether it's cocaine, Coca-Cola, or control. (laughs) If we're depending on it to numb our way through life, and we cannot seem to give it up, even though it's not good for us, we need help. We've got to stop playing demigods and allow God to be God. So if you just take a moment and ask the Lord to show you, what is it, God? Sometimes we get more and more pain because we just have a little too much pride. We don't need willpower. We need God's power. I'm going to ask you to, to hold your card up to God when I pray. And then I'm going to ask you to do something a little more difficult. In the next week, I'd like you to prayerfully seek out one safe person that you can share this with, that you can ask to hold you accountable, that you can pray with over it. Because there's something that shifts when we share with someone else and when we let them in. And that might be a hard thing for some of you. But the Lord will send you someone who can walk through this journey with you because you are not alone. Let's bow our heads and let's hold up our card and our heart to the Lord who heals. Father in heaven, I'm holding my invisible card up to you today. And I'm asking you to deliver me from every sin, from every stain, from every every evil device, from everything that I cling to instead of clinging to you. And I bring these people before you today because it is not by accident that they are sitting here hearing these words this Sabbath morning. You see what they've written there. And maybe they didn't even have the courage to write anything, but you see what's in their heart. We need you, God, and you're big enough. Your arm is not too short to save us. So we just want to take off our mask today. We want to invite you to send your spirit to begin a healing process in our lives. And I'm asking you, Holy Spirit, to give courage to those who really will struggle with finding a person to share their hurt, habit, or hang-up with. I pray that you will provide a safe, godly person to be a prayer partner, to walk through whatever it is with each one of us, Lord. I want to give you praise for the journey that I've been on in my life, some of the things I never thought I'd thank you for. But I can thank you because I have an understanding, a little understanding of what some people go through and 
And I know when I look at certain faces that they're hiding something because I've worn that mask myself. So Lord, I bring our church to the foot of the cross today.